Back in 2011, there was a 21-year-old athlete who had squatted 500 reps, and his teammates saw him collapse in the weight room. They thought he was joking until he started shaking uncontrollably, and then the coach called for an ambulance. The patient had rhabdomyolysis, hematuria, renal failure. That was pretty extreme physical activity that he put himself through. And he had sickle cell trait, trait, not sickle cell disease, which is known to increase the risk of exertional rhabdomyolysis, but then compartment syndrome in his legs started to develop. The pressure in his legs exceeded the perfusion pressure, and without relieving that pressure immediately, the chances of amputating his limbs increased as he was sent in for a fasciotomy. Despite this athlete having sickle cell trait and being someone who did physical training to that extreme, there wasn't recognition for what was going to come up 18 months later when he came in with stage 4 kidney cancer. This almost doesn't make sense because the patient was 22 when this happened. At least in 2011, we thought of cancer as a disease associated with age. Still mostly do. So how did this happen? The excessive physical activity and the sickle cell trait. Those are associated with a particular kidney cancer that this person had, but it's an under-recognized one, thought to be very rare, but appears to be more common now than once thought. That cancer is known as renal medullary carcinoma. So renal medullary carcinoma is abbreviated as RMC, and it is a kidney cancer that predominantly afflicts young African Americans with sickle cell trait or other sickle hemoglobinopathies. Usually, it afflicts people who are young. The median age is 28 years old, and it is a very aggressive kidney cancer. If left untreated, it can take your life even within three months of diagnosis. RMC was formally described in a 1995 paper. Records show that there was an idea out there at least 20 years before that that there existed a kidney cancer that was just different than other kidney cancers. 33 patients from 22 years prior were analyzed and they described the tumor occurring in the kidney medulla in patients who had sickle hemoglobinopathy, who are between the ages of 11 and 39 years old. Specifically, all of them were believed to have sickle cell trait except one who had sickle cell disease. They were all black, no delineation of American, or if they had Islander ancestry. By the time these tumors were found, the cancer had already metastasized and half of the patients died 15 weeks after nephrectomy. All of this is different than most other kidney cancers. Aside from RMC, other kidney cancers don't have this level of association with sickle hemoglobinopathies. Kidney cancers aren't all the same. Renal cell carcinoma as a space has been changing very quickly in the last eight years. Pull up NCCN guidelines for first-line treatment in clear cell RCC, the most common subtype, and you'll see that it's changed on average almost once every year. Collecting duct carcinoma looks like RMC under a microscope, but it's not associated with sickle hemoglobinopathy and it happens in older patients. Collecting duct carcinoma and RMC come from the same place in the kidney. They look similar, but genetically, they're different. And if cancers are different genetically, it means that they can behave differently, so their treatment will be different. If we go by genetics, renal medullary carcinoma and malignant rhabdoid tumor, which is a kidney cancer that happens in children under three years old, are similar. But the athlete who squatted 500 reps wasn't under three, he was 21. The 1995 paper didn't describe anyone under 11 years old, and RMC and MRT look different underneath a microscope, even if the genetic mutation that happens in both are the same. So which genetic mutation is that? I mentioned in the video about the farmer who cut out his own skin cancer, that early 1980s study of how insulin works led to the discovery of the mutation in 2002 that causes more than half of the melanomas out there. Similar happening for RMC. Because in the early 1980s, scientists were studying how sucrose was fermented in yeast. They found a series of genes and associated proteins that were responsible for this. Early on, they found these proteins form complexes that use ATP to rearrange nucleosomes, rearranging how DNA is packed. This is called a switch sucrose non-fermenting complex, Swiss SNF complex, and the seemingly obscure discovery in yeast is applicable to renal medullary carcinoma. A year after the RMC description was published, scientists found one of those sucrose non-fermenting genes is not only found in humans, it was discovered multiple times. At the time, they didn't know that this protein is missing in a disease that was just formally described the year before, but it's this HSNF5 INI1 BAF47, now called SMARC-B1 gene, that's missing in renal medullary carcinoma and malignant rhabdoid tumor. 
This brings us back to sickle hemoglobinopathies and how we think RMC develops. Dr. Pavlos Misal and team published a 2018 paper linking the two. If the oxygen levels are reduced to very low levels, then even if you have sickle cell trait, the red blood cells will change shape into sickles. That can happen, for example, in the part of the kidney called the medulla, because the medulla has very low oxygen levels naturally. And so the red blood cells in the medulla, if you have the sickle cell trait, will not have their normal round shape. They will look like sickles. A medulla is the inner region of an organ or tissue. In the kidneys, the medulla is distinguishable from the outer region, the cortex. The kidneys filter blood to produce urine. A better way to look at this is that kidneys reabsorb water to maintain homeostasis and the rest becomes urine. When you think of the absorption of water in human systems, one idea that comes to mind is sodium and the osmotic gradient. A hypoxic environment is needed in order for the kidney tubule to create and maintain a hypertonic interstitium. This this hypoxia is significant when we think about sickle hemoglobinopathies. If hemoglobin is the protein carrying oxygen, and the individual has a genetic mutation in the gene for hemoglobin, then when an erythrocyte enters an anoxic environment, then we can expect it to sickle. And we know this happens because erythrocytes of sickle cell trait patients do sickle when PO2 is less than 20, like in the kidney medulla. So in normal function, RBCs sickle in the kidneys in patients who have sickle cell trait. Hypertonic environments cause DNA double strand breaks. If RBC sickling in the kidney medulla exacerbates hypoxia, then we can also expect DNA repair to be impacted. Put together, you can expect a higher chance of deletions and translocations in the kidney medulla cells in this setting because breaks are gonna happen because of the hypertonicity and it's not clear that the repairs will be high fidelity because of the hypoxia. Renal medullary carcinoma happens more often in the right kidney versus the left, but why? The left kidney's bigger than the right. You would think if there's more cells on the left, it should have a higher chance to get the mutation there, but that's not the case. Hematuria also comes more often from the left kidney because of how the left renal vein is connected between the aorta and the superior mesenteric artery, but the right renal artery is longer than the left renal artery, and greater lengths are associated with greater resistance to flow, all other things equal. And we know kidney infarctions from elicits are more common on the right than the left, meaning the right side is more prone to ischemia, leading to worsening hypoxia in the right kidney versus the left. So if DNA repair is impaired because of the hypoxia and SMARC-B1 is missing in every RMC case, then we could hypothesize that's how SMARC-B1 gets deleted, but why that particular gene? Four years after the RMC description was published, the first full human chromosome was sequenced, chromosome 22. Found here is the gene for SMARC-B1. There's a lot of human diseases associated with chromosome 22. Right by SMARC-B1 is BCR from the Philadelphia chromosome, translocation 922, breakpoint cluster region. You also have the primary immunodeficiency de George syndrome, also known as 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, which happens in at least one in every 3,000 to 6,000 births. That is an area that tends to break, and why does that happen? Part of the reason is because of the way the DNA is written there. There are multiple areas there in that part of the DNA that contain what we call palindromes. So in the DNA code, and it is like a code, this is like a writing, there are palindromes in the same way that there are palindromes in our natural language. Whether you read it from one end to the other or, or the opposite, they are the same thing. So that can also happen to the DNA, but when you have too many areas, then the mechanisms that may try to repair any damage in those areas may get too confused because they may not be able to understand, oh, where did this name start from? Was it from the left to the right or from the right to the left? 
And because of that, those areas may be more likely to be repaired in the wrong way. Hence why those areas are the ones where you can find these mutations that can lead to cancer. In RMC, mutations don't come from changes in single nucleotides, like what happens in BRAF V600E melanoma. The most common way SMARC-B1 is lost is by deletion of one allele and translocation of the other in line with the hypothesis of increased double-strand break due to hypertonicity and impaired DNA repair due to RBC sickling causing worsened tissue hypoxia. SMARC-B1 in normal function is known to antagonize CMYK, a gene and associated protein that are nuclear phosphorylators. Simply said, keeping that in check prevents the cell from replicating uncontrollably. So when SMARC-B1 isn't there, then we could expect some kind of uncontrolled replication. We can expect limited chromatin remodeling and chromatin relaxation is one of the first things to happen upon DNA damage, which is happening because of the hypertonic and hypoxic medulla. All of this leading to replication stress, which is a hallmark of RMC. This could be why platinum-based chemotherapies and gemcitabine and doxorubicin can have a response in RMC patients because these agents increase DNA damage, worsening replication stress, overwhelming the cell's ability to repair that damage, causing the cell to die. Response rate of 29%. But few patients, 13%, survive more than 24 months. Men to women is two to one in RMC, median age, 28 years old. These are people by almost every measure, cancer is not at the top of your differentials, and we can see it. In 95% of individuals or subjects, patients who have RMC, the cancer has spread already outside the kidney into the regional space, typically those lymph nodes that become enlarged. This advanced stage presentation is the nature of the RMC that is an aggressive cancer. So unfortunately, by the time patients realize that they have something wrong, whether it's pain or bleeding, when they go to, to the bathroom to urinate, or if they've lost weight, or they have cough in some individuals, all these are manifestations of cancer. Dr. Tanir and Dr. Masal and their group have put forth hypotheses and have tested those hypotheses and have put forth a model for how RMC is linked to sickle hemoglobinopathies. But even though our knowledge of RMC is better in 2021 than in 1995, and there's definitely still a lot more work to be done in both understanding and treating it, it seems like a different set of issues altogether exists now. RMC is not rare. It is invisible and we make it, we need to bring it up, we need to make it visible, we need to educate the community, the, the healthcare providers, and once you have a trial for those patients with RMC, they will come. And Dr. Misao, my colleague, now is leading several of these trials for RMC patients. So it is not as rare as we thought. Wikipedia still emphasizes that as of 2009, only 120 cases of RMC have been reported. But looking through the literature, there's cases that were misidentified as a different kind of kidney cancer called collecting duct carcinoma. We know now that was probably RMC. In America, the bulk of cancer patients are treated at local centers, not big university hospitals. If a center sees hundreds to thousands of patients per week and is entirely focused on just treating patients, they might not have the staff to do research, let alone write and publish patient cases. So for sure, there are more RMC cases never published than ones that are. And that would be the ones that weren't mistaken for not only other kidney cancers, but things like HIV, urinary tract infection. STDs, like Herman Connor's case in the Chubby Emu video, link in the description below. Going even further on Wikipedia, under the entry for chromosome 22, there's also no mention of renal medullary carcinoma, at least at the time that I'm publishing this in August 2021. And we know that SMARC-B1 loss happens in all RMC cases of which that gene is on chromosome 22. You see, some people talk about RMC on social media openly with what appears to be contempt. All of this contributing to the notion of you'll never see it because it's so rare. We hear with Nizar Tanir of at least one, two or three new cases, new patients with RMC in the US per month. There are three million people in the United States with sickle cell trait, but there are 300 million people with sickle cell trait in the world. That's 
a hundred times more. That would mean that there might be a hundred or two hundred or three hundred new individuals who may develop RMC in the world per month, but we never hear about them. And that's if we were just counting Dr. Tanir's hospital, because his hospital isn't the only one in this country, it's likely a lot more people than that. No matter what, 120 cases being reported in all of history up to 2009 is lower than the reality. And unfortunately, that downplaying manifests in the real world to the care of actual patients. We used to think that colectic duct carcinoma is more common than RMC, but now, five or six years later, that now because of our focus on RMC, we realize that RMC is probably 10 times more common than collecting duct carcinoma. A lot of the diagnoses that used to be collecting duct carcinoma and we used to not even connect them with the fact that they were afflicting young individuals of African descent, now we realize retro retroactively that they actually were RMC. And this is why, again, raising awareness is important. RMC has been invisible for much too long and it is key that we do our best to make it visible. And the more we do that, the more we will realize how much it's impacting the lives of people, young people. All of this brings us back to the case of the athlete who squatted 500 reps and collapsed back in 2011. The year before, in 2010, the NCAA issued a policy that Division I athletes confirm sickle cell trait status or opt out of testing. But now, it looks like there's a link between renal medullary carcinoma and extreme training. The last potential risk factor, and this is an, one that is modifiable potentially for RMC that we're now beginning to understand, is the relationship between RMC and the intensity of exercise. We know that if you carry, for example, the sickle cell trait, or if you have sickle cell disease, and you do very, very intense exercise, then that can have repercussions. So for example, if you have sickle cell trait, you may be more likely than the average to have muscle breakdown, and this is called rhabdomyolysis. I mean, the same way, when you do too intense exercise for long periods, that can potentially make the red blood cell sickle in the kidneys more often, causing damage in the kidney and thus increasing the risk for RMC. So it is important for these individuals to be extra cautious if they have sickle cell trait, to make sure they drink a lot of fluids and to moderate their exercise and not to have this strenuous, high-intensity exercise continuously. Anyone involved in American sports is going to know that there's going to be pushback on this because some high school or college ball coach is going to be out there saying that we're scaring their star athletes from training, scaring their star athletes from going to two-a-days in the middle of the summer before the season, from going to their sports performance and conditioning, from playing on the field. We're not doing that. What we're saying is don't overtrain your athletes. I remember when I was in high school, some of the football coaches would say things like, if your shirt isn't completely drenched in sweat and you can't wring it out afterwards, it wasn't a good workout. Work harder later today, work harder tomorrow, and even harder in the second session tomorrow after that. If you can't do more reps and more weight or run faster than you did the last time, you're not working hard enough. Those particular coaches would take the good versus great pep talk and just absolutely corrupt it with terrible training ideas like that. And the repercussions were mental, physical, and we know now there's a link to cancer if that particular athlete has sickle cell trait or disease. If you're a coach, you can't change that person's genetics. You can change how you coach that athlete. And if you're an athlete, don't let sickle cell hold you back, but don't do something like squat 500 reps thinking that you're doing yourself any favors. I can't think of any situation where doing that would make you stronger or faster. And that's a brief discussion on renal medullary carcinoma. Very likely still rare, but not as rare as once thought. Check out Dr. Masal on Twitter. Check out the 500 squat video and Herman Connors video. Thank you so much for watching. Take care of yourself and be well.